It was about 11 o'clock and the party was in full swing when, in the middle of truth or dare, Anthony Williams called on his wife to confess to the worst thing she had ever done, and she announced that she had been unfaithful to him. There is a context, a backstory. It's always there. Margaret wasn't just bitchy, she was drinking. Well, who doesn't? They were all celebrating the start of the season and the end of the semester. And that is not all. She felt unwell. She felt exhausted. Exhausted. Somehow just wrong. She was breaking down. And she wanted to go to bed. She constantly suffered from chills and vague discomfort in her shoulders. She thought she must be sick with something. It was bad enough that she wanted to cancel the party, but Anthony insisted they go. Then there was a game. They played truth or dare to remind themselves of when they were children. Gambling and drinking helped Margaret a little, but the catch was that she was angry with Anthony. I wasn't very angry. It just burned slowly. Tony, stop showing off. Just shut up for a change. He ranted about the Iraq war and global warming and the worthlessness of their students and everything, was terribly bossy, and ended up telling anyone who would listen that the worst thing Margaret could ever do was fry it up. People laughed and exchanged witticisms, exchanged urban legends, and interrupted each other. They would reach for the coffee table for nuts, candy, or other snacks, sometimes spilling a little wine or whiskey. The small fireplace smelled of smoke in the air, and those sitting nearby were flushed from the flames, even Margaret, who was trying to extract some warmth from it. Everyone else seemed to be having a great time. Just before her turn to play, Margaret saw Matt Cameron kiss Nancy Eberly under the mistletoe. It wasn't surprising considering all the teasing and flirting that was going on, but the kiss was too long and he kept one hand on her waist and the other on her cheek. He whispered something to her. It was obvious and immodest, but no one else noticed. Julia Cameron was at the center of the Urban Legends group. Jake Eberly was three-quarters drunk, staring into the fire and occasionally raising his head to howl at the end of the story. It was Margaret's turn. Based on the nature of the challenges, she realized that her task would be to lift her skirt up to her hips so that everyone could admire her thighs and underwear. She was wondering who would have to show the naked part of her body first. Anthony laughed. Hey, this is just for me. Stop that. Tony looked around. Stop it. Then he said, no, not that. Come on, Margie, you better tell everyone the little truth about your worst deed. And Margaret felt a dark wave roll over her. Damn it, Tony. The musleys at the base of the neck tensed and became tighter and tighter. And then a growl escaped at her. I changed. You. And then it was too late. Everything had already been said. Margaret remembers that her husband's expression did not change at first. He continued to grin but it became more and more tense until he finally relaxed. They looked straight at each other, and his expression became so soft that it seemed almost serene. The room was filled with silence. The noise of the party did not die down immediately, but quickly enough. Those closest to her started howling like Jake Eberly did when they first heard her confession, but they immediately understood what was happening. Those who were not participating in the game continued to talk until it became clear to them that something important was happening by the fireplace. Eventually, everyone turned to look. Margaret was the center of the world. Nobody said a word. Even Jake took notice. Could you explain? It was Anthony. He was no longer Tony. His voice sounded sober, quiet, thoughtful, not the least bit belligerent. She would have thought he would be combative. Why was he so gentle about this? She thought, my marriage. Then the whole truth about who had heard came to her, their entire circle of friends. They all sat or stood around her. They all waited for the whole story, the dirt, everything that would allow them to feel superior to her and despise her. Everyone had questions in their heads about how this could happen. They were so preoccupied with the idea of an exposed, honest cheater in their midst a real, available, flesh-and-blood woman to replace their pale fantasies that when they returned home, they would have very good sex. How wonderful to have Margaret's real infidelity in mind. Husbands will assume that she will be easy and wives will think the same and be scared by it, but they will like the idea that cuckold Tony might need comforting. Someone might even make the fantasy come true. Oh, Tony, please no. Margaret still looked at Anthony, then at her friends, then back at her husband. 
She doesn't remember when her hand went to her mouth. Tony. She doesn't remember whether she let out a moan or a cry, but she knows that for what felt like the longest time, she didn't actually say anything. She asked him for forgiveness only with her eyes. Please. She remembers somehow getting to her feet. Please. She remembers looking around and finally saying, I'm sorry, trying to leave the circle without touching anyone, one at a time. I'm sorry, for every person she approached, every person she encountered. Finally, she reached the corridor, where there was no one, then to the bathroom, closed the door, locked it, sat on the toilet, covered her face with her hands, and rocked back and forth, because she knew that with three words, she had destroyed her world. It didn't take long before there was a knock. Poor Margaret, sitting on the toilet in an icy bathtub in someone else's house, knowing what would happen, not every step of the way, but along a terrible, long way. Thousands, millions of people shared their experiences, but she didn't feel like she was part of any community. Poor Margaret, trembling and wiping her face with her palms, first the left side, then the right, then the left. How much was she shivering because she was so cold? I can't look him in the face. I can't watch him despise me. Anthony should have left by now. He, of course, grabbed his coat and left her there alone, his indignation multiplied by public humiliation. Where will I be? The bathroom looked like a cell, all the better for locking herself in, she thought. She was small, like a camera. The length from the door to the back wall was barely enough for a small linen closet, a simple sink under a regular medicine cabinet with a dim light, a toilet, and the only unusual thing, an old-fashioned clawfoot bathtub. It was perfect for her. The tiny casement window on the back wall had milky white glass, so she was cut off from the world. It was cold there, like a cell. Is it because everything there was laid out with tiles, colorless black and white, in a checkerboard pattern? So cold, a cold that sucked away all the warmth she had. Margaret hunched over and pressed her arms to her body. Now she was really shaking. She started to have a headache and felt nauseous. She couldn't hear people from here, just mumbles, so she was safe for now. She imagined that she would stay here forever. It would soon be a terribly lonely place. But she didn't deserve better. I made love to him and deceived him. There was no other place for her. Could she bear the cold? Maybe she could wrap a few towels around herself. What happens when other people need to go to the toilet? Another knock. It seemed to be reflected from the tiles. Even sounds hurt her. Sharp sounds ricocheting off the walls. Margaret presses her palms to her temples. There's a pounding in my head. Margie? It was Judith, the owner, her friend. Margaret glanced at the door for a moment and pressed herself closer to it to escape the cold. Again. Margie... Hey, let me in, baby. Judy? Was her voice strong enough to penetrate the door? Get up, Margaret. The distance was only seven feet. But Judith called a third time before Margaret got there. By then she was shivering from the cold, and her arms ached from holding her up. When she opened the door and saw Judith smiling, she rushed towards her, laid her head on her friend's shoulder, and began to cry, bitterly. Judith patted her on the back. She seemed completely calm as if her friends threw themselves on her neck and cried every evening. Come on, baby, let's wash your face. I'll warm up a washcloth for you. Lock the door. Margaret trembled so much that her voice trembled. What? Please close the door. Trembling voice. I don't want anyone to see me. Everything is fine. Is... Please, close it. This effort took everything Margaret had left. She staggered to the toilet and sat down, and when she did, she fell over on her side with an attack of dizziness or fainting. Certainly, but it's okay. Tony explained everything. It's a joke. Margaret blew into her hands. She rested her hand on the side of the bathtub and leaned over so that the bathtub would stop rocking. Then she turned and gave her friend a look of confusion. This would be funny in a comedy. Pure joke. It takes the heroine a long time to realize what she just heard or while E. Coyote runs through the air, delaying his doom through lack of awareness. Margaret didn't find it funny at all. She didn't get the joke, because there was no joke. What do you mean? 
Judith's expression changed. Ooh, she whistled softly, the kind that mostly men use to signal importance. Well, that explains everything. He has your back and does a pretty good job, I might add. He's a quick-thinking guy. I don't understand. What are you talking about? What is Tony doing? He explained that you two had prepared your, uh, confession in advance, but you never expected people to take it so seriously, and you had a little too much to drink. You know, bad, bad, bad. People want to apologize to you, but he tells them that you need to be alone for a few minutes. He makes them tell stories about drunk friends. He's back in the spotlight. Margaret still looked like she didn't understand. Finally, she covered her face with her hands again. Nobody will believe it. Well, I was almost fooled. Judith giggled. It sounded sarcastic. In any case, you can deny everything. But, Margaret began and almost stopped, he knows the truth. And that was the real problem. A problem without a solution that had to be pondered over while Margaret huddled on the toilet, feeling really nauseous. She grabs the seat underneath her to keep it still, lost in memories. That bathroom was different. We did this one afternoon at their house while his kids were home. How could they not notice me? We did it in the shower, copulating under the running water while John's kids watched TV downstairs, less than 45 minutes before Janet was due home. I had to dry myself off and get dressed quickly, then sneak out the side door. My hair was still wet and dripping down my back. All this time I was terrified, scared, and hot. What? I'm sorry. What did you say? Margaret was getting worse and was too tired to stand. I need to lie down. I asked when this happened. Margaret wiped her eyes with a washcloth. She unwrapped it, smeared it all over her face, and inhaled the warmth. It was a long time ago. It started on the night of our 10th anniversary. Oh my God. Looks like you had some serious problems. It wasn't that serious. It was stupid. Tony didn't buy me a present, and he had to cancel our dinner because of a work meeting. I was offended and furious. And you ran into Mr. Sympathetic. More like Professor Magnificent. Please stop pushing. Judith held out her hand and Margaret handed her the washcloth. Judith soaked it in hot tap water, wrung it out, and handed it back to her. Who was that? No need. He's no longer here. Nobody ever found out. Until tonight. However, she could not hide it from herself. She couldn't stop herself from remembering because she was weak from what she caught and the drink and what she said. Yes, she remembered. It was such a small thing in the big picture to be upset with your husband. Then she saw handsome John Bowler at a club without his wife, and they started flirting. She thought she shouldn't dance with him, but she did. She knew he shouldn't get so close, but she let him. She was afraid that something would happen and allowed his hand to first touch her thigh and then take her fingers. When they approached her car, he said, What you need is a good anniversary kiss. He gave her a gentle, almost chaste kiss that went on and on and turned into something completely different. Before he let her go, she knew he was going to take her. And how long did this last? Three months. Three? Oh my God. Judith's eyebrows rose high. She whistled again. It was the exact same whistle that Anthony used. I thought maybe you were going crazy over the weekend. No, I had a blast. Margaret tried to laugh, but it came out as a whimper. I think it was for real. It was so crazy. I know it's a cliche, but that's how it was. Judith asked something else, but the past came back and pushed Judith aside. This made Margaret remember the first time in John's minivan in the club parking lot. She remembered herself saying, no, we can't, not here, and John saying, look. It took several minutes to lower the rear seats. There was a plush sleeping bag. The windows were tinted. It wasn't until a few weeks after he broke up with her that she realized he had made preparations for her or someone else. Are you all right? I mean, physically? Judith was still with her. I do not feel well. Not today, but six years earlier, Margaret felt the urge, the excitement, the fear, the unspeakable thrill. She and John Bowler French kissed, and he squeezed her breasts through her dress. I was out of my mind. He lowered the dress to my waist and raised it, 
exposing my legs, caressing me, kissing me, pulled off my underwear and caressed me, just like my boyfriend did in my senior year. I felt guilty, but I wanted it. I knew I shouldn't do this, but I wanted it too much. It was exciting. Finally, he pulled down his pants and lay on top, and we made love. My God, why did you let me be so pliable? Why didn't I feel how terrible it was? Sorry, God, it is not your fault. They weren't naked. Her dress was wrinkled at the waist. His trousers were down to his knees, but he didn't bother to take off his shoes or jacket. At home, everything was different. Anthony was as apologetic as a man could be. He gave her a beautiful card, flowers, and an expensive bracelet. He promised to give her a pleasant evening. But, 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 he was late with all this. He failed her, and I still felt the excitement caused by the touch of another man and the memory of the impulse. She hurried to the bathroom to clean herself up and was so horrified that she almost confessed everything to Anthony that same night. But, the last but, she lay awake until 3.30 a.m., replaying the details of how John Bowler drugged her. When he called her the next day, she hesitated and prevaricate, and finally agreed to go to his house. I'll tell him why I can never do this again. By the end of the day, it became much easier. Six years later, Margaret couldn't stop her memories and couldn't stop herself from realizing that her actions had ultimately damaged her husband, her marriage, her family, everything. Why did this have to happen? It was almost unlike me, but it was definitely me. I thought about you all the time. I was obsessed with your body. I've been thinking about doing this with you all day, wondering how you'll do it next time. After being with you during the day, I thought about it at night. I was in a bad mood until I met you again. Another knock. Quiet double knock. This must be Tony. You two need some alone time. No, don't leave me with him. But Anthony wouldn't stand for it. We need some time alone, Judy. Anthony closed the door and Margaret stood up and retreated towards the bathtub, far enough to push the curtain with her body. Her feet were now cold all the way up to her calves. For some reason, the curtain felt scratchy and unpleasant where it touched her skin. She had no strength. The shaking intensified. Tremors shook her in fits and starts. It's time to sit down again, isn't it? Or lie down. She couldn't continue standing there. Will Anthony understand if she can't stand? She could no longer look him in the face, not even to beg him, and certainly not to ask him if she could sit down. This is where the retribution began. She almost staggered, trying to calm down. She clasped her hands in front of her, as if in prayer, and Anthony... Well, Anthony took a breath and asked, Are you okay, honey? His voice was soft. His voice is, Anthony. This was wrong. He used a voice that pierced right through her. He would demand an explanation, or tell her he was done with her, or slap her. She half hoped he would hit her, but at least let her go home with him. Whatever he did to her, she deserved it. She tried not to cry again. I'm so sorry, Tony. Oh, it's okay. I was acting like a jerk. I deserve it. That's not the point, dear. You know that's not true. I never wanted you to find out. Tiny black dots, mist, began to appear in the air. About the novel? Well, that was a long time ago. I think John Bowler has disappeared from the picture. At least I hope so. Anthony smiled, and Margaret again did not understand anything. She tried to think, but instead she felt something terrible happening inside her. It got darker, and she felt weaker, and the next thing she knew was that she was sitting on the edge of the bathtub, and Anthony was kneeling in front of her holding her up so she wouldn't fall into the bathtub. He apologized. Sorry, honey. Lean on me. This is good. Put your head down. Fine, fine. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have shocked you like that. His voice sounded as if from afar. They were floating somewhere, Margaret and Anthony, floating together among the clouds. Maybe it was a dream. She was wrapped in him, safe in his arms, held by him, pressed against him, breathing in his scent, protected by him. My Tony. They were floating somewhere far away, high above the ground, in some green tropical place. 
she and her husband. It was a blindingly hot day. It was wonderful. Can you hear me? Tony spoke. Her Tony. My God, you're all on fire. Margaret regained consciousness and had some terrible combination of pain in her arms, back, legs, weakness, and dizziness. She had a headache. Tears appeared in my eyes. Tony, what's happening? They lay in the bathroom on the checkerboard floor with Anthony holding her in his arms. He stroked her face, kissed her, and looked worried. Her face was hot. Her whole body was burning. Lie still. I'm sorry, Tony. You definitely have a serious infection, honey. I have to take you home. Margaret tried to stretch her leg. She got caught on the toilet. She squirmed in Anthony's arms and suddenly realized exactly what he had said and how important it was. He knows, and he still loves me. And again a comedy episode, and again there is nothing funny in it because what comes with this knowledge? Guilt, relief, regret, gratitude, humiliation. Memories. It's a powerful mixture. Margaret began to cry again, but this time she buried her face in Anthony's chest and allowed him to comfort her. He loves her. She couldn't stop crying because Anthony loved her. Anthony let Margaret cry. He took a moment to free her leg so she could lie more comfortably, then pressed his lips to her forehead. Shh. It's okay, honey. He held her as he often did after they made love. When Margaret was finally able to speak, she said, I thought you would hate me. You are my beloved one. Don't worry. Nothing will come between us. She cried a little more, then asked, How long have you known? From the very beginning. No, do not look like that. I don't know exactly when it started, not the day or hour, but I found out a few weeks before it ended. He knew how to keep secrets. It's a pity that I didn't know so much. God, I was an idiot. You haven't even emptied your deleted email folder. I could have told the investigator in advance where you would be so he could get the photographs. Margaret made a sound against Anthony's chest. Half scream, half whimper, moan, something like that. Few weeks. Oh, my baby. Anthony simply kissed the top of her head again. Everything is fine. It's in the past. He raised his head and called. Judy, could you get Margie something cold to drink? But you never showed it. I couldn't tell you. I had to decide what to do. And that's in the past. He thought, if you knew how much I hid my hatred for you, you would be horrified. I have never experienced anything like this in my life. Margaret reached out her hand to his face, but she was too shy to really touch him now that she knew he knew. You must have been in so much pain. Yes, and so it was. Sometimes it still comes back. He took her hand and kissed it. And we don't have to discuss it. Anthony tried to help Margaret to her feet, but she became dizzy again, so they returned to the floor. He called Judith and her husband again, and Margaret was lost in her memories again. I thought I was being so careful. I thought that if we had sex every now and then and I gave you a nice show, you'd think everything was okay. There were questions Margaret didn't want to ask, but now she had to. These were the things that she knew would cost Anthony dearly if he ever found out that she had worried about from time to time over the years. She had to ask him now because he knew all along. How could you stay with me? This was followed by a sigh. Margaret felt it in Anthony's chest as strongly as she heard it. I read the Dear Abby column. The woman asked what she should do with her Don Juan husband, and Abby advised her to decide whether she would be better off with or without him. I followed the advice. Another sigh. A lot of everything. I wanted you. I wanted to hurt you. I wanted what was better for the children. But how could you still love me? Margaret asked the question tremblingly because she was afraid that after all this time he would decide that it was not so. I've always loved you. For a long time I thought it wasn't true. I tried to be practical. Everything changed when I remembered what we were like before, how we once held hands, talked, walked, hugged each other, and played. I remembered the little things you did for me because you were gentle. For some reason you annoyed me. He kissed the top of her head. Why? You took time away from my work. You talked about things that bored me. 
You didn't do your homework well. Nonsense. We argued over little things, Margie. It wasn't that bad. It was just flat. Why don't you take a look around? All he said out loud was, I missed you and realized that I had lost you, and my only hope was to get you back. Margaret noticed the hesitation in Anthony's voice. She saw that he was looking into nowhere. Towel hanger. Door. You loved me all this time. It was. Even then. She touched his face with her hand, and when she moved, the faintness intensified. Anthony helped Margaret stand again, leaning against him, then slipped his left arm under her knees and lifted her like a child. My poor, my dear, I once thought that since you are so strong, nothing would harm you. The room shook, and then they found themselves in the corridor. Margaret's right arm swung back and forth like a doll's. She didn't hear anyone. I must have broken up the party. She pulled her hand up to Anthony's neck, straining with all the strength she could find, so that her face was on his shoulder. My strong man, she whispered. He smiled. Would you carry me like that if you knew how bad I was? Could you still love me? Could you even bear to touch me? I'll tell you if you ask, but please don't ask. Anthony carried her to a closet at the back of the house. Everything in the room was made of wood, floors, walls, ceilings. For Margaret, it was like a refuge deep in the forest. She was safe with Anthony, he took care of everything. Anthony laid her down on the leather sofa, took a glass of apple juice from Judith, and helped Margaret drink it. Judith placed the fingers of one hand on Anthony's thigh as Margaret stretched. Anthony ignored it. This is much better, Margie. It's much better to be gentle with you than to want to crush you. It would be better if this didn't come up again. At one point, I planned to convert everything into cash and disappear with the twins. When you returned home, we would no longer exist. All you would have are photographs of your affair. But there was another side. Judith left again. I remember what you did. I didn't know why you suddenly became so cute. Margaret's forehead was covered with a fine sweat. Right after it was all over, it was when you took a surprise trip to Blowing Rock, just the two of us, and your mom came over to be with the twins. Yes, part of my plan. I didn't know what I would do if you refused. It was either this or... I don't know. Shrug. He was at a loss for words. I didn't know if it was already too late. So much has changed. When we were first together, you sparkled when you were next to me. This is the word my mother used. Shine. I thought it was stupid. Childish. This confused me. But at that time, you didn't shine anymore. What if... She almost stopped herself. What if it hadn't ended then? You were both married. You both had children. I was counting on it. You don't have to know everything. I burst into Bowler's office with copies of the photographs and told him, If you ever see my wife again, I will give this to Janet and spread it all over the university. You call Margaret this minute and tell her that it's all over, that you're tired from this. I could kill that bastard. Well, you were right. He broke up with me. And I was surprised at myself, feeling sorry for you, for how sad you had become. I thought I'd bask in the glow of your broken heart. But this was my chance to get back into the game. All Anthony said was, he was an asshole. As Anthony helped her to her feet, her face burned, her body burned, energy flowing out onto the floor. How could you trust me again? It just took time. I was grading a test, and you leaned over the chair to kiss the top of my head. You asked if we should go to bed? That's when I realized that you wanted me again. Maybe I could tell you this. I've also been messing around with your laptop for over two years. I still do this from time to time. I will never tell you this. Margaret raised her head as if about to say something. Then, trying to shake off the nauseating memories of John, she stumbled out of the office, across the hall, covering her mouth, back into the bathroom, where she began to vomit. Anthony followed her and brushed her hair aside. When Judith looked in, he said, I'm sure it's the flu. They waited until she vomited. Then carefully, very carefully, they helped her to the car, half carrying Margaret. 
who felt a sour taste in her mouth. The next day, Margaret lay in bed at home, sweating and wheezing, still dizzy, nauseous, guilty, and unhappy. Anthony placed a plastic trash can next to her in case her stomach gave out and a travel mug of ginger ale with ice. She thought she wouldn't be able to eat anything, but he proved her wrong by bringing her soda crackers and a cold orange with the peel on. Tony placed them on the table. Margaret grabbed him around the waist and held on to him as if she was drowning. I love you so much. She was crying again. Maybe it was weakness due to the flu. Maybe it was a relief that a weight had been lifted from her. Maybe it was love. I promised myself that I would never do anything like that again. I promise I will never hurt you again. I love you too, honey. And I know that you love me. You started being nice to me. I thought you loved me again, but it didn't happen right away. Then one day I caught you off guard in your office during lunch break and you beamed. Anthony removed her hands and put her back to bed. Her eyes were still feverish. He took her temperature, then kissed her. No need. You'll get infected. Then you can court me. She pulled him back and kissed him. She felt dizzy. She felt dizzy from everything. I want to do this. I want to look after you. And I want to make love. You're in. This will be the best way to get infected. Tony. If I ever even look at another man, please kill me. I promise. I'll slap you in the face. He clenched his fist and lightly touched his fist to her lips. I'll hurt you. I'm serious. Me too. He laughed and kissed her forehead. I can kill you. Anthony had to go back to the kitchen to prepare dinner for the twins, so Margaret had plenty of time to think. There were so many things she couldn't tell him. Ever. You don't understand, Tony. I love you so much that you will never know. But I was never your horny bitch. I wish I was like that with you. The worst thing about the entire period of the affair was that John made me his lustful bitch, and it was terribly exciting. What's even worse is that I can't forget it. As Margaret fell asleep, she thought that Anthony would probably catch the flu from her and she would be able to take care of him. Meanwhile, Anthony went online to check that John Bowler was still working at a university far away. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.